Good morning, saunterers and lovely friends. We are sauntering again to the stable and it's our ninth uh, session today, which is amazing. So we're going to have fun and um, let's pray and ask the Lord to help us and guide us. Awesome. Lord Jesus, good morning, Joshi. Lord Jesus, we want to thank you for your incredible love. Lord, thank you that all of this was not something you just decided on the spur of the moment. This incarnation, the visit of Jesus to the earth, was something planned before you even made the earth, before you even created anything. You had all of this planned and worked out. And Lord, we love it. And we love the fact that you were thinking of us even before you started creating anything. Lord, you are so good and we love you. We thank you. Amen. Good morning, Lorraine and Alison and Ruth and Joyce and Rachel, Sarah, Forchi, Lorraine, Floor, everybody, Sandy, great to see you, lovely people. Now today we are looking, we've kind of, yesterday we looked at Job, which was amazing, and we discovered a whole load of stuff hidden in the book of Job, which is kind of an interesting place to hide it because Job is kind of one of those books that it's not for the faint hearted. Good morning, Fran and Chris and Kev and Francis. Good to see you, Francis. Ah, uh, everybody. Sandy, Sally, good to see you guys. Um, Job is a great place to hide it because it's a book that's not for the faint hearted. So if, you, if you're going to really be diligent in seeking God out, you're going to find him in some amazing places. But if you're just like, no, nah, I can't be bothered, you probably miss some crackers. Anyway, here we go. Today we're in the book of Psalms. Now, you remember those who were sauntering with me right at the beginning of lockdown, hashtag one. We were sauntering through the Psalms and that's what got us into this whole thing. And I have to say it was Anna, my wife's suggestion that I should do something on a daily basis and put it out for people. And it's been brilliant for me. So I'm really, I've loved it. It's been amazing. It's been a huge um, privilege and joy to be um, sauntering through the scriptures. It's been absolutely brilliant. And I think we've had some fun, but we, we went, when we started, we were in the book of Psalms and we saw loads and loads and loads of examples, didn't we, of Jesus. And so what I'm going to do is just pick out a few. I think the jury's out whether Psalms has more messianic references, more sort of prophetic breadcrumbs leading to Jesus than the book of Isaiah. I don't know. Perhaps answers on a postcard on that one. Which one do you think has got more references to Jesus, the book of Isaiah or the book of Psalms? However, we're going to just pick up a couple from over the next couple of days. We're going to have a little look and we'll see. So Psalm 2 today, it's, a, it's just such a brilliant psalm and it's full of stuff. It says, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Well, I mean, there's our first breadcrumb. The word there anointed is Mashiach, which is the Hebrew word that we, we anglicize into Messiah. And in Greek, in the New Testament, the word there is Christos, which is Christ. And so Jesus Christ is not his surname, it's another, it's a kind of definition of who he is. It's like saying, um, I don't know, Paul the pastor or Pete, I don't know, you know, or my dad, John the blacksmith. It's like Jesus the Christ, Jesus the Messiah. So, um, so he's saying, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain and the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord, Jehovah, and against his anointed, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs and the Lord holds them in derision. And then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion on my holy hill. 
Verse 7, this is really, really cool. He says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You, you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, <coughs> excuse me, lest he be angry and he perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are those who take refuge in him. Now we're not going to go into every detail of this psalm, but we're going to pull out some really important points. So number one is there has been since the beginning of time, um, it would seem, or certainly since some point in the early days before things really were the way they are now, I don't know how better to put it, there seems to have been hostility from some of the rulers and the spiritual cosmic powers that had authority in God's kind of heavenly realm, if you like, there seems to have been some hostility to accepting God's rule and a rebellion broke out. And we understand, looking at the whole balance of scripture, that there was a particular person, personality, should we say, a spiritual being called Satan, who rebelled against God and says, no, I don't want to be part of your kind of thing. I want to do my own thing. In fact, I'd like to be ruler over the earth myself. And he comes to the earth, deceives Adam and Eve. They sin. They hand over their authority that they've been given to Satan, who becomes the prince of, the, of this world, according to Jesus, the prince of this world. So Satan, um, Satan and his cohort of kind of of cosmic angels, cosmic powers. I don't know what they are, what really how to really define them. They have authority. They have a degree of authority, but they have a huge amount of authority on the earth because Adam and Eve handed it over to them. Right. But there is in this psalm something much bigger than Satan's rebellion is going on. God is laughing and he's finding the whole thing somewhat humorous. Now, the only way we can think of an opposition as humorous is if it isn't really a threat to us, isn't it? It's like, imagine a really powerful rugby team like the All Blacks and they're going to play against the local high school. And you, they would probably be in the dressing room. They'd probably be laughing. They wouldn't be taking the whole match particularly seriously. And it would all be just a bit of fun and not really a huge threat. And that's really what's going on here. God is looking at this thing and he's saying, this is so funny because it's going to happen. I've decreed it. This is going to happen. And so good morning, Ezekiel and Pat and Mike. So he's saying, this is vain. Why do the nations rage? It's like, why does this high school rugby team bother even putting out a team? Because they're going to just get flattened by the All Blacks. They're just no match. And this is the same. And he's saying it's like they've gathered themselves together. They've amassed their kind of combined strength to rebel against the Lord's anointed one, against the Lord's Messiah, against the Lord's Christ. Well, this is the Lord is Jehovah, the covenantal name of God. And this is Jesus, his anointed one that is being spoken about. And so he's saying they say these things in verse three, like let's burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. In verse four, he who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision and so on and so on. And then he says, verse six, he says, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, on my holy hill. And this is the fulfilment, really, of the prophecy that um, God gave to David when he says, I'm going to, if you remember a couple of days ago, we were looking in 2 Samuel where God promised to David that God would build a house and one of his descendants would remain on the throne forever. Well, where did David rule from? He ruled from Jerusalem. And so the word Zion 
relates to Jerusalem. It's another name for Jerusalem. And so God is saying here that I've set my king in Zion, in Jerusalem, and he's going to reign forever. Now, we know that if God's going to reign forever from a physical city, it means the physical city can't be physical because if it's physical, it won't last forever. Ooh, will it? You know, and so in the book of Revelation, if we leap forward right to the end of the book, we discover that there is a new Jerusalem, a heavenly version, a heavenly city that comes down from heaven, from God. And that's where Jesus is. That's where he's reigning. He's reigning in this heavenly city, which is effectively um, God's kingdom is where his rule extends from. And it's the impact of it is becoming felt on the earth and then ultimately will be over all the earth as Jesus reigns forever and ever and ever. And that's the ultimate outcome of the story. But verse seven is really, really important. He says, I will tell of the decree. Now, a decree is a rule or an edict that a king or a monarch makes. And so back in the day when kings had absolute power, they could make a decree and that was it. It was just going to happen regardless. And God is that kind of king. He rules with absolute authority. If God makes a decree, it's going to happen. Let's just leap forward. Keep your finger in that place. And let's leap forward to Romans chapter one, because look at this. Look at this. This is so cool. Um, and verse four. So this is the Apostle Paul. He, no, sorry, verse. let's read from verse one. He's Paul the Apostle and he's writing to the church in Rome and he says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, the good news of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, Christo, uh, Yeshua Mashiach, I guess, if we're talking, uh, you know, in Hebrew, that this is the one, this is the saviour, the Messiah, that was promised before, our Lord. And this is the one that David, or the psalmist, is writing about in this psalm. He's saying um, that there is a decree and this is the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. Now, this is really interesting. If you are like me, it might not be if you're not right. But here's the thing. So there is there has been this decree since before the beginning of time that the Messiah, the the uh, the one, the anointed one is the son of God. And God has decreed this um, since before time. He says, the Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. And so He's saying, listen, this has been decided. This is all wrapped up. All you rebellious angels and earthly rulers like Stalin and Hitler and anybody else who you might care to mention who has rebelled against God, shaking their little sweaty fists against heaven. God says, listen, there's been a decree. It's already a done deal. And this is my son. He's the Messiah. He's the anointed one. It's all been decided beforehand and the nations are his heritage. How cool is that? And Paul is echoing that in Romans there. And he says, yes, this was prophesied not once, not twice, but many, many times through the through the Holy Scriptures. And then when Jesus came, he was actually by According to the flesh, he descended from David, which, of course, was prophesied, which we've seen already. It's David's son. Oh, and according to the Holy Spirit, he was declared the son of God in power when he was raised from the dead. Wow. And so all of this is like it's like we've got 
this big old Bible that is just stacked full of references. I don't know if I use this, um, I don't know if I used this example before in this series, but um, there was a man, I don't know if he's still alive, he's called Peter, Peter W. Stoner, and he decided, he was a mathematician, he decided he was going to work out what was the probability of one person fulfilling the prophecies of that relate to Jesus in the Old Testament. And so he got this bunch of mathematician, mathematics students together and they did this, these calculations using their um, planetary sized brains and worked it out that if there was one person who could fulfill even eight of those prophecies, the probability would be of one person fulfilling eight of the prophecies of the Old Testament that relate to the Messiah, um, that would be, the probability would be one to the power, one times 10 to the power 17, <laughs> which means nothing to me. And, but then he used an example and he said, if you covered the entire state of Texas with um, silver dollars and piled them up, I don't know how many feet, several feet deep, he said, I can't remember what it was. It would be the same as asking a blind person to go into that, um, the state of Texas and pick up one coin that was a special one that he'd marked in a secret way, first time without a mistake. One to the power, one times 10 to the power 17. There are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament that relate to Jesus. The probability of that is just, it's impossible that it could be anybody else other than Jesus. And so really, <laughs> the, the choosing of not believing it, if you like, is a choice to not believe it, rather than based on evidence. And so when people say, oh, the science and all this, don't talk about science. God invented science. You know what I mean? Let's not pretend that science somehow has more power than the Bible. The Bible was written by the one who invented science. So I don't think we should get too lost on that. Um, right, now then, let's just quickly jump forward a whole hundred or so chapters and just look at one more, um, one more prophecy in Psalm, in the book of Psalms. Psalm 110, and we're going to pick up a few more over the next couple of days. But Psalm 110 is again this thing about the reign of the Messiah, about the rule and the extent of his kingdom and so on. And verse, the fact that he is, this Messiah is God. This is really important because um, many, uh, what do you call it, um, cults and sects have sprung up over the years where they've had this idea that somehow Jesus, the son of God, is somehow less than God because he's a son of God. And this idea of being begotten by God and so on. And so this this one is a real cracker because um, it, th there are many, many also that say the same kind of thing. But this is a good one. Good morning, Denise. And good morning, Kaz. It says, uh, Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord... The Lord, that's Yehovah, the covenantal name of God, the God of the Old Testament, if you like, says to my Lord, and the word there is Adonai, which is king, prince, lord. The Lord says to my Lord, well, who's writing the book? Who's writing the psalm, rather? It's David. He's the king. So in terms of people in authority over David, there isn't anyone. He's the boss. He's the guy who can rule by decree in the land of Israel. So he's the top of the food chain in terms of the hierarchy in Israel at the time. So he says, the Lord, well, we're not going to dispute him, that's Jehovah, says to my Lord, which is the one I submit to, which is another Lord, but it's Adonai. This is now we're talking about the Messiah. We're talking about Jesus as we know now. He says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Well, what's he just said in um, Psalm 2? He said, this is the decree. The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage. 
and he's the king on the holy hill and he's going to break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces and all the rest of it. And he's saying, now, O kings, be wise, be warned, serve the Lord with fear. Kiss the sun. So <laughs> here we go. So the Lord says to my Lord, he's saying this son, this Lord is my Lord. Now we should only worship God. David knew that. He shouldn't be worshipping anybody else other than God. He certainly didn't have multiple gods. But Jesus, the son, is also God. So it's as we said right back when we looked at John chapter 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. So here we go. Psalm 110. The Lord, the Lord, Yehovah, says to my Lord, Adonai, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemy. Your people will offer themselves freely in the day of your power. And so on and so on. And then he says in verse four, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek or after the order of Melchizedek. We said, didn't we, in 1 Samuel, we saw the one where he says... Um, I'm going to raise up for myself a faithful priest who's going to serve me forever. Good morning, Paul. Great to see you last night. Who's going to serve me forever? This high priest, this king, this ruler forever and ever is Jesus. There is no other person. There is no other. <sighs> there is no other person to fit the bill. And Jesus is the one who fulfills prophecy after prophecy after prophecy in the Old Testament and even as we saw in Job bits that are hidden away and don't get a mention they also refer to Jesus in such a level of detail it's absolutely astounding so ladies and gentlemen the great news is that even though sometimes the rulers of this world the dark forces seem to have some power and they seem to have some influence over the affairs of men and there have been some really dark times in the world's history the decree has been made since before the world was made that the lord has set his son on his holy hill his king his king his rule is forevermore and he will make the nations come under the authority of that king who rules from the heavenly Jerusalem. Wow, I hope that wasn't too complicated and too theological, and I hope I didn't tie myself up in too many knots when I was explaining it, because this is wonderful. So listen, if you get, may, if you want to just go back over it, listen again, do that. If you missed the saunter through the Psalms, you can find them all on YouTube, on the Prayer House Weymouth YouTube channel. Do subscribe, do like it, and do share it and let's be getting it out there this because this is really important stuff this is not tr this is not bible trivia this is fundamental foundational absolutely wonderful and glorious hey good to see you Fliss. good to see you johnny dunlop lord jesus bless us today go with us lord let us know what Emmanuel really means God with us. Let us know that presence in our hearts is not just a theological belief, but it's a living reality to us moment by moment by moment. In Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Have an amazing day, you guys. Lots of love.